Please welcome founder and creative director of Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, Vishan Chakravarti. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I come to you with a thesis that in these very divided times that we live in, that the design of our communities can help connect us uh, and that we can bridge our divides and solve some of the big problems of our time. Um, and so uh, you should be skeptical of this thesis. I mean, what does design really have to do with any of this? 30 years ago, I entered architecture school extremely reluctantly because I thought to myself, with everything going on in the world, and even back then, we knew about climate change, we knew about the massive inequities that there are in the world. We knew about AI. This is Hal from 2001. Um, right? So we knew that there are all these massive problems. And as someone who was born in India, I am extremely sensitive to the backdrop for all of that, which is the world is growing at this very rapid rate. Most demographers think that the uh, world will level out at about 10 to 11 billion people by the end of the year. We're about 7.7 .7 right now. And so how are all those people going to live with all of those challenges in a way that's equitable and ecological? Now, what's interesting when you talk about global growth is global growth sends people here spinning. Oh my god, climate change, how are we going to handle all this growth? Where most of the growth is happening is where you have the lowest carbon emission per capita. Most carbon emission per capita happens in countries with very low birth rates, like ours. Um, and so the challenge is actually much closer to home. And when you look at the data more uh, in a more granular level, you find that carbon emission per capita is quite low in cities and in rural areas. It's all the stuff in between that's the culprit. And so many of us who believe in cities beat up on this form of development. This is six suburbs and six continents from around the world. And it's clearly not urbanity, and it's clearly not ecological. But you have to ask yourself, why are billions of people moving towards this form of life? Well, maybe because this is the problem, that what we're building in our cities isn't particularly urbane. It's not particularly great. It's not particularly affordable. Uh, it's quite banal. It's quite homogenous. And again, six housing res uh, buildings from six continents around the world. And so this urbanity thing is uh, more elusive than it might seem. Uh, I would argue that urbanity is who we are culturally. If you look across antiquity, you look across every culture, we created collective circumstances to live in, not just for economic reasons, but for spiritual and cultural reasons. Um, and so what's interesting about that is it applies at every scale. So the image on the left is actually a Japanese farming village. It's very similar to the village that my father was born in in India. People lived in like, great social coherence, even though it's a farming village. That's Schitt's Creek in the middle, or Hong Kong on the right. And so urbanity can manifest at any scale. And so we need to separate the idea of urbanity from the idea of big. A metropolis can be quite segregated, or it could be urbane. A village can be quite uh, urbane. And so that's important, because if we're going to talk about cities and communities, we have to be inclusive of our smaller communities. Um, there's a Greek city planner, Doxiades, who is very focused on this particular issue. And what he claimed, basically, is that people sometimes were born who thought differently. They might look different, but they also maybe thought differently. And they also often were lonely, and they found themselves moving to denser and denser circumstances where they would meet more people like them. And it was actually those people who then would connect, form ideas, and change society. Um, and so I believe that as architects and urbanists, if we, build, if we build more connective communities, if we act for more connective design, we can actually be a catalyst for this sense of urbanity. And that will result in better places, more pluralism, and better stewardship of the planet. Um, and all of that is in pursuit of something. Uh, and I call it jobs, justice, and joy. Now, many of you are mayors or work with mayors, and you've heard this uh, mantra, right? Jobs, jobs, jobs. How many people used to run on that platform? Jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, in a post-pandemic circumstance especially, you can work anywhere. So jobs, jobs, jobs isn't going to do it. And I think what most human capital is looking for today, whether it's someone young or someone uh, senior, 
that they w- sure they want to have a functioning economy and jobs, but they also want a sense of justice in their environment, and they want joy, which is not some squishy idea. It's this idea that you can experience something great that you can't experience in your study working at home. Um, and so I'm going to give you a couple of case studies at different scales that talk about this. Um, this is a project called Interoculus in the city of Columbus, Indiana, not Ohio, Indiana, a town of about 55,000 people. If you know it, it's a design mecca. And we were given, we won this prize, and we were given this challenge of helping to revitalize the downtown. And we uh, went out into the community, did a tremendous amount of community engagement, both uh, virtually and uh, physically, and found out that there was this intersection in the center of town where people would occasionally close the streets and stage uh, uh, different festivals and so forth. And um, so we had this idea of building a canopy over that intersection to help create more of a platform for those kinds of activities. And we had influences as far back as the Pantheon and wigwams of indigenous peoples, as well as the architecture of local fairs. And we came up with this canopy idea so that the intersection could function like an intersection during uh, normal days. But at night, it could be lit and have projection and be a platform for events. Um, And so we went out and raised some money uh, and built this thing in about five weeks uh, and kind of transformed this place. It's out there right now in Columbus as we speak. Uh, It uh, gets lit at night and it's become a magnet for the community. Cars slow down when they go under it. People gather there and take selfies. And then the opening night was one of the most diverse events I've ever been to in my life. And I say that as a lifelong New Yorker. Uh, the, the woman who organized the opening party had everyone from Indian dance music to hip hop to Japanese school children. It was extraordinary. Uh, and uh, it's become something that I think has really taught me how a little piece of acupuncture can really change a community. And it reminds me of one of the things, one of my favorite architects, Aldo Van Eyck, used to say that whatever space and time mean, place and occasion mean more, which means it's how human beings inhabit and make a place great that is what is important beyond the architecture itself. At a larger scale, the Domino Sugar Refinery and the Brooklyn Waterfront, I've been working on this site for about 10 years now. Glorious Park, designed by Lisa Switkin, a very, uh, very uh, brilliant landscape architect. We were given the assignment of putting a creative office building in that sugar refinery, which is a historic landmark. And I won't go into all the details, but we basically inserted this new building into this old building. There's a gap in between with greenery growing in it. It's all kind of surreal and special and magic and crazy. And there's this great event space at the top that just opened, and I think it will house a lot of community events and be something that looks very important. You can see different cultural events that are happening there. Now we're in the process of opening up the ground floor with food and beverage. It's very, very open to the public. How buildings meet the ground is critical to this entire equation. And uh, this building in in its working uh, reminds me, I work with Amanda Burden, my uh, mentor, a friend, uh, and uh, we work together on the High Line. And this building reminds me of the High Line because what it does is it connects our past to our future. And I think that's what people are looking for in urban growth, not just erasure. Um, Brooklyn as well, but a very different part of Brooklyn, the poorest part of Brooklyn, uh, East New York. We're working for a pastor to build an all affordable housing project, about 2,200 units on his 11 acres. Uh, We bonded over this sketch that was the beginning of this work which was the idea that we'd build housing on the perimeter and create this cultural heart that included his church, a school, and a 300-seat performing arts center. And this is not a part of town that gets performing arts centers. Um, and he was very, he had read his Jane Jacobs. He was very cognizant, again, about the ground floor, wanted a lot of social infrastructure, 24-7 daycare. Uh, this project uh, is just, go, well, going back to what Mayor Breed was saying. This is a project that the community loved. It took five years to get approved, right? It'll be seven or eight years before the first family. This is all affordable housing, including uh, supportive housing all the way to workforce housing. Seven years uh, for a project that's basically motherhood and apple pie. So we really need to think about that. Um, This includes both affordable rental and those maisonettes or two-story affordable uh, ownership models. 
Uh, we were actually using that prototype to now build a net zero, uh, more affordable, kind of gentle density uh, form of housing that we think could be useful elsewhere. Uh, so it's been a very important project for us. And you can see it's a very quiet, dignified kind of architecture. There's the future performing arts center. That'll happen through philanthropic money. Uh, and then the last project I want to show you, a truly joyless place, uh, New York's Penn Station. Uh, this project has been uh, kind of I don't know, it's my life's work in some weird way. Uh, this is the busiest transit hub in North America, 650,000 people a day, incredibly cramped, incredibly unsafe, and as you can see, an architectural masterpiece. Um, uh, uh, we're working with a public-private partnership group to transform it into that, to make it a unified mixed-use building, take out the Gardens Theater on 8th Avenue, and completely transform the station from the bottom up. Um, I like to think of this as the jelly and the donut. Uh, the public sector and the private sector have been doing all these things around this building to try to fix it, but the problem is the jelly itself. Uh, and, and so that starts at the track level where we're introducing all these new vertical circulation elements, ADA elevators, uh, making the platforms much better, and then getting rid of the rabbit warren of dead ends and urine-filled corridors uh, and transforming it into higher, one single concourse level, about 24 feet high in, in volume, um, uh, that'll be a much, much more gracious place, as well as giving the sidewalks real breath, air, greenery, making it a welcoming and inviting place for once in its existence. And then, again, the architecture that's around it that I, I won't belabor because I think that's less important as part of the story. These are just some before and afters. This is a view up uh, 8th Avenue transforming it into, uh, that's the historic Amtrak station, the Farley building on the left side, and then the new building on the right is the commuter station. Uh, looking back at the Empire State Building, um, and that's the after. Uh, and then the sidewalk again, expanding it to about a 30-foot sidewalk, so you actually have some grace as you come in and out of the city. Uh, the concourse level, lovely, um, uh, that goes to about 55 feet, uh, and then the last slide, just this transformation. We have to do these things in our cities now. We can't just rest on what the past, uh, what happened in the past, because we have to bring people back to our cities. And I really believe if we design our cities to be a great collective experience, we can do that and solve our problems. Thank you. Thank you.